Hello and welcome to The Network Effect, the show where we open up our little black book and bring you some of the most amazing entrepreneurs and business leaders from around the world that are scaling businesses, pushing innovation, and really just taking risks to uh, develop the business world and give you an opportunity to really connect with them. Um, so today we have another amazing guest. Um, it's going to be a slightly different format today. We wanted to sort of dedicate the show to the interview. So we will have a very very short Q&A section at the end. Um, so while we're having the interview, if you've got any questions, please feel free to chuck them into the LinkedIn chat and we'll try and get to them at the end if we can. We've also had some questions submitted from some of our regular viewers as well, which we really appreciate. Um, but today's guest um, is really honestly a, a bit out of this world, or at least will, will be soon. Um, here at Centura Global, we focus on helping companies to um, expand around the world. Uh, but our guest is really pushing beyond that. He was one of the founders founding astronauts for the Virgin Galactic um company and, and we all obviously recently saw Richard Branson um, get into space and we see that there's obviously a bit of a race going on there with, with Jeff and Elon as well. Um, so it's a really exciting space to be in, um, sort of pushing the boundaries. <laughs> I, guess, I didn't even mean that. <laughs> that was my, no pun intended on that. Um, it's a really exciting uh, space to be in and, you know, I mean, we're even thinking about changing our name to Centura Galaxy now because we're, all, we're going beyond global. Um, will hopefully be one of the first people to register a company on the moon. Um, that one is an intentional little joke in through there, but <laughs> we're, we're really excited to talk innovation, um, the, the journey and risk of, of an entrepreneur and, and the sort of space frontier and, and what that sort of means for companies and, and people on earth and innovation as well. So I guess without further ado, Asma, we're going to jump to an amazing interview and we're really excited for it. So uh, Great, thank you. let's run the yep. trailer. to another Network Effect show. And today I am absolutely, personally, very, very excited to meet or introduce you all to a very special guest who actually is very difficult for me to describe because he is so many things. He is, I mean, what can I say? I mean, could he be, he's a, he's a philanthropist, he's an author, he's an astronaut. He's the modern day Indiana Jones. And I'm not going to say anything further than that and actually let the man tell you about himself. So please, let's welcome Pear Wimmer. Pear, good afternoon. So Pear, I think, as I just said to you, I, I, you know, I described you as a modern day Indiana Jones. Am I correct in that assumption with all the things that you've achieved so far? So just wanted to really, before we get into the topic of space, is to ask you some questions about all the adventures that you've had and what has really driven you to the things that you've achieved. Sure. Fundamentally, what, what's driving me is the quest for, for learning, um, whether it's in the setting of uh, formal education. Uh, I, I, I did study a lot in, in, in my youth. Uh, I've got four master degrees in, in various fields, <laughs> yes. law and political science and business and international relations and all sorts of exciting things. So I, I do like education, both in a formal setting, but also uh, equally importantly, in an informal setting, shall we say, in what I call the University of Life. And the University mm -hmm. of Life is really out there. It's the travels, it's the journeys, and, and it's, where, it's where life and your desire takes you. But, but wherever you go uh, around uh, this planet, um, you would always, if you have an open mind and an open mentality to be positive to the people you meet, you will always be blessed with some amazing experiences, meet some amazing people, interact with some amazing cultures, and, and that's what I've been doing on my journey as I've been traveling through, um, well, now 84 countries on Earth, mm -hmm. including some very remote ones and exciting ones, which I'm happy to, to share here. Fantastic. And so I guess the question I have is that, you know, you are somewhat, I would say, a risk taker, right? So you take many risks and you, you have many adventures. Now, not everyone can take go that far in terms of you know push themselves or push or go beyond boundaries to be able to achieve the things that they want to achieve do you think this comes by nature that you're naturally nurtured in this way or is it something that you learn and through your life experiences you actually push yourself to, to achieve these things that's a very good question um i think it's actually a combination of things um 
for, for sure, it is not in everybody's G, uh, DNA mm. to just do crazy and wacko things. That, that are generally people on planet Earth that, that are very, very happy, uh, living a, a happy and quite uh, relaxed and quiet life. And, and, and good for them, absolutely. No, nothing uh, bad or, or to say about that. that that's fantastic. And then there are others that are perhaps a little bit more risk willing, risk prone, um, and perhaps also with a with a, a great zest for life, mm -hmm. wanting to try things, do things, make mistakes, do them, try again, uh, and 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 always try to sort of push the boundaries. And mm -hmm. and, and 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 I guess I kind of fall into that latter category. Um, I, I do enjoy <clears throat> a quiet evening at home on a on a on a Saturday evening or whatever. But but for the advice to the adventures. I really do enjoy working with clever people, exciting people, and people who are also willing to push the frontier um, to become pioneers in whatever field it is. Um, for me, obviously, adventures is very close to my heart, and I like to do uh, exciting things. For me, originally, originally it started just with with a little bit of traveling first in Europe and then in Asia, and and then more, once more. You know, once you sort of catch the travel bug yeah. uh, you want to go more and more extreme and, and that's really for me how it evolved to be honest uh, mm -hmm. once I've, I've sort of traveled uh, in, in Asia next thing I wanted to do Africa and mm -hmm. get out to the exciting places safaris and things and the next thing I found myself living with the Indians in the Amazon yeah. so it, exactly. just keep pushing it pushing mm -hmm. it and it's just very exciting so I would guess all of these adventures led you to space. So tell us about your journey to space. Where did it all start? Um, so you've been to all these places, these wonderful countries, the Amazon. And as I said, you know, you've had all these adventures on Mount Everest. Uh, you've done skydiving. You've done all of these things. So where did space come into this? And when that moment that you decided, actually, I want to go to space? Yeah, I was probably one of the very first uh, private Europeans to sign up for private space mm -hmm. uh, because I bought my first ticket to space in the year 2000, uh, so 21 years ago mm -hmm. today, so really long time ago. And, and at that time, uh, people thought we were mad. Uh, they thought it was we were either sort of between mad and dreamers, and certainly the, some of the first press interviews I did back then, I, I remember that. They, they didn't believe us. They mm -hmm. thought we were a completely lunatic, but that's fine. Um, but it was so new, it was so pioneering. And when I started doing my first training in Russia, mm -hmm. uh, side by side with the Russian cosmonauts in Star City, uh, just outside Moscow, when I started doing the first training there, uh, we were lucky enough to get access to those facilities. Um, and and late, one year later, um, I, I also had the good fortune to actually be in the launch pad literally 10 minutes before the very first private uh, astronaut went up, Dennis Tito. Uh, I was on the, Bi on the Baikonur launch pad uh, just, just before saying goodbye to him and, and watching his beautiful launch into space. So I was definitely one of the pioneers and one of the early early birds in private space. And because of that, the journey has been exciting and tremendous. Up and down, of course, we have had setbacks along the way. We have had accidents. Sadly, we have we have lost people along the way as well. It, it certainly has not been a straight line. But my God, it's been so exciting. It's been really an interesting journey. But from the early early days, it was really like getting access to the Soviet training facilities, because mm -hmm. obviously the Soviets, they have some fabulous training facilities. They obviously put uh, Gagarin up, uh, Sputnik, wow. and, and, and have a very, very solid history uh, through Rocco Cosmos. And and, 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 and and we managed to get access to those facilities. And I remember doing my first uh, centrifuge training um, at, uh, at Star City, which is basically with one of the biggest centrifuges in the world that can pull 30 Gs, 30 wow. Gs. <laughs> I wouldn't recommend going that high, to be honest, because <laughs> humans would die after 12 of sustained, sustained Gs, but, but for things, they can spin them very fast. Mm -hmm. So anyways, uh, I, I was sitting into this centrifuge and spinning around, going faster and faster and faster, and, and eventually I was pulling uh, 3GZ and 6GX this way. And, and completely simulating a, uh, a, a spacecraft launch uh, with a three-stage rocket. Uh, absolutely fantastic. A bit scary at first, to be honest. Uh, a little bit uh, claustrophobic being in, in that centrifuge, but 
but eventually you get the hang of it, and, and trust me, it's actually yeah. really good fun. Yeah, I can imagine. So you must have to prepare quite a lot to be able to, to go on this journey, right? So what does it take for a human being, really, to go into space? Because obviously, in my imagination, I don't know enough about the subject, but you're floating, you know, all kinds of things. So how do you physically have to prepare, and mentally, of course, to be able to achieve that? Sure. Uh, there, um, I usually do some health checks in, in London. I'm currently dialing in here from Denmark, where I've been, mm -hmm. been because of, of COVID and, and lockdown. But otherwise, normally I'd go to uh, see the doctor in London, mm -hmm. uh, get a good medical check to make sure everything is, is all top notch, because uh, otherwise I've, I'll be grounded. Mm -hmm. And then uh, on the day itself, um, we'll get health checks by the Russian officials or if if I train in America by the American officials, uh, they will do simply health checks on the day uh, just to make sure we are safe to fly and fit to fly, which, which is reassuring. Um, and leading up to all of that, uh, I would obviously go through a, a, a special training regime. I, I would, you know, do jogging and, and, and stuff. And, uh, and now I have a personal trainer actually who helps me with certain exercises and stuff. Uh, so, so I'll do some things uh, to stay fit not that we are sort of like superman fit or, or we are, <laughs> we're sort of uh, living in the fitness gym every day uh, not at all but we just make sure that we stay fit and ready for action because once you get exposed to the g's uh, mm -hmm. uh, because you're flying fighter jets or or or, or the zero g's if if you're in the vomit comet or the the um you know the uh the plane that takes you up and then nose dives mm -hmm. down for 30, 40 seconds and you're sort of flying weightlessness effectively. Uh, it's a good thing to be trained and, and to be physically in a good good place. And obviously mentally as well. Yeah, yeah. Um, yeah. You know, always good to have a mental surplus, be ready for and positive for what you are to meet because uh, there are physical challenges ahead of, ahead of the training, I can tell you. It is not and it will never be like just jumping into a Boeing 747 and flying London, New York. Uh, it, it is not that, going into space. Uh, you will be exposed to some significant G-forces just by the mere physics of it and mathematics of it, simply because you have to leave uh, the Earth's atmosphere. So is, is space going to be really for those who are the exploratory types, I mean, so for the explorers and the adventurers, or is com space going to become more commercialised and accessible for pre many people? I mean, what's the future in space? Is this something that, you know, I, I've seen that you've done some work around, that you've talked about uh, how it can be accessible to other people as well. I mean, what does the future look like for space? We're currently going through a very exciting era of private space. Um, so if you think about the excitement uh, back in the late 60s, 1970s, when the whole Apollo program was going on in America, competing with the Russians, and you had these sort of two countries competing uh, to get to the moon and, and, and achieve these various things with space. Um, whilst it's not completely sort of a space race at the moment, uh, the fact is that uh, in the past three or four years, so much capital has gone into the sector, to the private space sector, probably more than the combined 10 years prior, to be honest. It, it's really exponential, the amount of money uh, that has floated into it. I, I remember just 10 years ago how difficult it was for, for startup space companies or even somewhat mature space companies to raise money. Very difficult. Now, um, with all the excitement, not at least powered by the great uh, billionaire entrepreneurs such as uh, Sir mm -hmm. Richard Branson, yeah. such as Elon Musk, uh, such as, uh, as Jeff Bezos and others who have really sort of paved the way. That has attracted a lot of excitement about uh, space. It has put space high up on the agenda. What can space do for us? Where are the commercial business opportunities? Um, and they are there for sure. And that, ha that has really started to attract an enormous amount of capital. Um, at various level and, and then that capital attracts innovation and talent and, and then we go into this sort of positive cycle business cycle where lots of things are suddenly possible in the near term you will see a lot more uh, private humans going into space um, uh, I mean I'll be I'll be one of them <laughs> flying up and there'll be lots of others after me um, uh, and there will be other other rocket providers also showing up and also what you're going to see in the near term is lots and lots more satellite uh, launches on private rockets, uh, small satellites, mm -hmm. mini, mini satellites, cube satellites, 
not not the big ones that we are used to. Uh, I mean, they will also go up, trust me. But but there will be a lot of mini satellites that can do other things, such as provide free internet access uh, in remote areas of Africa, say. Um, and and there will also be uh, be other scientific things that they'll, they'll be going up. So there's a lot of things going on in private space at the moment, uh, which, which really makes me very very excited, to be honest. Yeah. So th there's quite a lot actually happening in this, well, I say space, in this in this industry as well, in this sector. We've, I've seen lots of emerging startups coming out, technology companies, lots of systems being produced, but there are limitations. I mean, what technology is exciting you the most in this area? Um, well, for me personally, it's uh, I like human space flights. That, that really gets me excited because ultimately as an adventurer and as, a, as an astronaut, I want to go up there. That's mm -hmm. So anything related to... Uh, propulsion and, and, and rocket technology, I, I find is super exciting. Um, but to be honest, uh, the, the bigger market opportunity, uh, if, if you take the commercial hat on, actually lies on the satellite and sending stuff up there, mm -hmm. sending things up there, doing medical experiments in a mm -hmm. weightlessness, uh, uh, gravity-free environment, um, or, or improving the cost of uh, telecommunications via satellite links and stuff like that. that. That's probably where the biggest commercial opportunity is. But as an adventure, as an astronaut, uh, I want to get more people into space, uh, mm -hmm. human space flight, uh, both suborbital and orbital. And eventually also, uh, I, I truly hope that we'll be able uh, in a not too distant future to put uh, a human, a private human on the moon. Um, maybe <laughs> first in the first in the first instance, maybe around the moon, um, a bit like uh, like uh, some of the Apollo uh, rockets did uh, before Apollo 11. Mm -hmm. with uh, Buzz and Neil actually planted their feet on the moon. Um, and, and then eventually, obviously, the big dream, um, like Elon Musk would, would have it, uh, would be to uh, fly all the way to planet Mars. That, that, I know that that's certainly his plan, and he has said very famously he would love to uh, die on Mars, just not on impact. <laughs> that's quite interesting. I mean, I've, I've seen you do a documentary with Elon Musk as well. I mean, he, you've, he's been described as the real-life Iron Man. I mean, how true is that? Elon is a true visionary of the 21st century, to be honest. Um, I mean, he is really uh, special, one of the very special ones. Um, uh, I mean, today he's kind of a rock star in the, with all the companies he's got going, and, and he's famously also on a good day, the, the richest person on earth. But to be honest, it's, that's not what impresses me most. What, what impresses me about him is his vision, his intellect, his ability to uh, think engineering solutions bring down uh, the cost base significantly. I mean, for instance, when he's launching a, a Falcon 9 rocket, um, that would cost maybe 60 odd million dollars. Whereas before, when you had NASA running the shuttle, um, it could easily cost $500 million all in. So you're talking about a cost reduction mm -hmm. of, of a very, very significant magnitude. And that's what private enterprise and, and intelligent people can do when, when they show up. And, and that's also where the good marriage comes in here between private enterprise and NASA mm -hmm. and, and the government agencies, because I think increasingly private enterprise has a very big role to play here to, in this case, become the taxi driver from planet Earth to the International Space Station and, and do that cheaper, faster, better than, than the than NASA would do. And, and yet then NASA can spend exploration monies on deep space and other things. So. So I think it, it really works very well, but it's thanks to these these big uh, visionaries. I mean, Elon also famously um, was, if anybody, the person, the person who changed uh, the world's view on electric cars. Mm -hmm. There's so many failed attempts in the past to really change this and to get electric cars going. Um, so many attempts have been quashed by the big three in Detroit, um, the, the, the traditional automakers, because every time something popped up, they will either buy it or close it down somehow. But Elon really won this this war. And look, look what's happening now. you got uh, Volkswagen and all the others uh, <laughs> uh, investing billions and billions in electric cars, and it's all being rolled out across the world. So. And that's down to one man. Uh, that's very impressive, actually. Very, absolutely. We've got a lot of questions coming in, Pear, so I'm just going to ask you one or two more before we get into the questions from the audience, because I think it's interesting that uh, people are asking us a lot about the space side. Um, the one question I do have is really, 
we all have a fascination with space, right? It's things that we dream about. I mean, I remember as a child, when I was at school, you know, we had those glow-in-the-dark stars on the ceilings. We used to think about space. We used to think about Mars and, and all the rest of it. In, in schools, we really struggle to produce great talent in the science subjects or in technology, or particularly in STEM. And I've been involved with the engineering sector and the oil and gas sector for many years, uh, some time ago. And I remember working with government and, and going into policy and asking, saying, why aren't we producing engineers in the UK? Why do we have to go overseas to be able to attract talent? What can we do as a nation? Because the fascination with space is natural, I think. It just comes from within. What can we do as a, as a society to be able to nurture children, right, to teach them science through space? And can anything be done about it? Uh, for sure, anything can be done about it. I think uh, certainly people like myself uh, has uh, the great privilege, but also an obligation uh, to go around to schools to talk about our experience, to talk about space, get them excited about it. I do that and I tell you, it's it's so much fun. It, it really gives me a thrill and kids are not afraid of asking anything. They will ask you, there's no filter on that, which is <laughs> fantastic, I really enjoy it. But when I show up in flesh and blood and talk about space and the excitement and they can see sort of my eyes are all super, uh, you know, super excited and when I talk about the planets and going to space, they really get excited too. And I've subsequently talked to a lot of the teachers and they say that it has really sort of elevated the excitement from these kids uh, to a different level than suddenly space is cool, science is cool, math is cool, uh, all those things. And I think there's definitely a motivational task that mm -hmm. some of us who are in that field um, uh, needs to be, pick up and perhaps do more. Mm -hmm. So that's one, one answer to your question. We need to do more, get out to the schools, uh, show the kids how cool this stuff is. And yes, it's a bit nerdy at times, but it, but it is really, it's, it's fun and space is fun and science is fun. And then I think more broadly, um, then it comes down to government priorities and policy priorities mm -hmm. and, and budgets and stuff like that, because you can also motivate across the board by allocating money public money yeah. out through the school yeah. system and and educational priorities and stuff like that but here we're entering into educational polit politics and stuff like that so mm. I, I really don't want to go too far down <laughs> no, that road fine. and leave that to politicians to sort out but, but but certainly there is a public role to play um, there's a private role to play for people like us uh, uh, astronauts and 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 engineers and stuff and then also engineering firms in their local communities mm -hmm. uh, i did um i did a, a charity road trip um uh, a couple of years ago here in denmark where we had a local engineering firm with some sort of connection to space either they were mm -hmm. supplying satellite components or something with a dot org and then uh, way more space and i tell you when we went around to those schools and presented both the practical applications that the company would present, uh, the excitement of mm -hmm. an astronaut going into space, and also the broader picture educational wise, it was a perfect package. Yeah. Um, so more yeah. of that, more of that would really go a long way, I think, to excitement. Because once you're in front of the kids, they, they truly get excited and, um, and, and no wonder, so do we. Yeah, no, absolutely. And I agree with you completely. I mean, I've had guests on the show before, or I've spoken to companies before, where I think this marriage, this enterprise marriage with this education and with real life people who are actually going to the going to space is actually could work really well. But what I'm going to do, Pear, please bear with us for 30 seconds. I'm going to bring on the other two team members to ask to so we can ask you some questions from the audience, if that's okay with you. So coming back to you in 30 seconds. Great. Hi. Uh, thanks so much for joining us today. It's, it's a pleasure. And, and um, yeah, we're, we're really looking forward to just jumping in with a few questions. We've got a little bit of time here. We've had questions submitted um, directly to us from some people who are very interested. Um, for anyone watching live on LinkedIn as well, if you have any questions, I, I will monitor that just now. So please feel free to throw some questions in there. But um, Gina, do you want to uh, start yeah. us off? Cool. So hi, thank you so much again for the interview. It's been really interesting and really good to meet you. So one of the questions that came through was around climate change and obviously climate change is at the forefront of most of our agendas these days or at least it should be but how do you think the advanced, advanced developments within space technology can help benefit life here on earth and what impact could that have on climate change 
uh, it could have a potentially significant impact, to be honest. Um, when they did the P Apollo program, um, obviously it was the quest for space, it was the space race, it was all of that that was driving it. But out of that came um, a lot of technology innovations and some, would, some could argue that the whole Silicon Valley uh, thing started happening uh, as, as a, as a spin-off of that. So, so it can be fairly significant. And, and perhaps we are not so much aware of how much uh, of this stuff we use in our daily lives that, that actually has a relevance to space or get a helping hand from space. Uh, but certainly when it comes to climate change, um, uh, all the satellite systems, the monitoring of the deforestation of the Amazon forest, uh, for instance, which is very easily done from, from space via satellites, the technology um, innovations that, that comes with that, the ease of communications, the uh, the cost of, of uh, I mean, when you send a rocket up, you gotta you gotta lower the the weight and the cost of transportation. Some of those things can also have a, a an, an implication on on Earth how you can do things faster, cheaper, and better. So there's a lot of spin outs, uh, little things, but they all add up to to, to big things eventually. Um, and it's also fair to say that uh, a lot of the astronauts who have been to space, who I've met, they have, if I dare say, um, a bigger view on life in a sense, and certainly appreciate more than the average how fragile, how small our little planet is, and also how unique our planet is. Because if you compare to all the other planets, uh, you know, that are cold or super hot and there's no trees, there's no water, it's, it's, it's just, there's nothing going on really. Our planet is really, really special, but it's very fragile. It's very, very fragile. So a lot of astronauts tend to have a very positive attitude towards uh, protecting the climate and, and doing that bit from it. And, um, and also more broadly, they tend to have uh, an ability to work across uh, geographies, ethnic, uh, ethnic backgrounds, um, countries, et cetera, et cetera. I mean, you would often see um, countries being in dis big dispute, uh, you know, China, US or whatever. But when it comes to space, they're all collaborating. And, you know, when, when China put the uh, Changi 4 on the dark side of the moon, it was with the help of the Americans and also the Europeans. Uh, it was one big collaboration. Um, the Chinese obviously took the trophy from it, but it was, it was certainly a big collaboration, whatever was going on on planet Earth. And so I think there's a lot we can learn from, from space. There's a lot we can do on the climate front from space and technology. Um, and it was certainly our great pleasure to contribute to that. And thank you. Yeah, that, that's a great one. And I think what's super exciting about the space is that sort of collaboration. And, and I think I've heard you say in interviews before about, um, you know, there's sort of this idea of a space race um, between, you know, Jeff and Elon and Richard and so forth. But I think you've said it, it's a lot friendlier than people expect. And everyone's kind of working together towards a, a joint goal. Um, I made a little bit of a joke about it in the start, though, as well. And once we get into space, you know, we might have companies up there and so forth. But <laughs> so, someone did ask the question, in the LinkedIn of, of who ends up monitoring who owns space or how it operates. Uh, I've also seen examples of companies potentially manufacturing products in space, um, which normally would have tax implications in, if you set that up in a country and so forth. So I, I, I'd be love to know your thoughts and if, you've, if it comes up at all of, you know, once Elon ends up on Mars, how, does he claim that bit of land for himself or has anybody uh, asked or thought about that yet? Um, a little bit. Um, there, there are actually international space law treaties. Um, so I, I'm not. I'm actually a lawyer by background, but I'm not a space lawyer. So there are certainly more competent people uh, to express their opinions on the topic. Uh, but I have studied a little bit of international law as, as part of my legal background, and and there are um, international treaties uh, for for regulation of of, of space in part. Uh, how that's done and uh, and who does what and that sort of thing. But obviously, it's very broad and 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 it's obviously uh, this was all put in place long time ago uh, where we, we, we weren't so busy going into space and now you have all these new things new problems that are emerging i mean who owns the ip who owns the land mm -hmm. who's got the right to and there's there's got to be this balance between you've got to make sure that it is attractive enough for private enterprise to do it to invest the dollars to get up there otherwise they might not do it um, and on the other hand, you also have got to look at the more broader societal interest of making sure you don't 
have uh, you know the moon owned by one private company. Uh, mm -hmm. I mean, you know, what's the justification for that? So, so there is a balance there. How do you uh, how do you do it? Um, there's some 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 legal framework, but but certainly you're going to have to see a lot more uh, legal conventions and treaties and set that are put in place. And then obviously you have the whole military aspect of it, and there it gets really tricky, because yes. there uh, countries are perhaps a lot less willing to do treaties and and figure out. One thing is regulating companies and telling them you can't do this, but you can do that, and you'll get your reward there. But when it comes to Star Wars or <laughs> military in space, space yeah. it, it's, it's a whole different thing and it's all secret and, yeah. and apparently nobody's doing anything up there and, and then yeah. next time you look up there suddenly is a lot of military satellites up there mm -hmm. so so um, yeah. and that's everybody for themselves I'm afraid in, in that regard so, so the military side is going to be a lot harder to get your hands around but but co the commercial side eventually you, you, you'll get some uh, further regulations put in place. Do you have another okay. question? Do yeah, you know? so thank you so much for that. That was really insightful. Um, another question we had, well, actually just an internal one, was that at Centura, we obviously encourage our members and those within our network to take risks. And as you were discussing earlier with Asma, you yourself are quite a big risk taker. So I guess what advice would you have for young entrepreneurs or young potential astronauts who would consider a space venture? Um, and what advice would you give them on taking risks? Number one, you only have one life, live out your dream to the fullest extent. Absolutely. Think out of the box. Uh, don't be shy. Think out of the box. Come up with whatever is the craziest idea, most exciting idea, and then zoom in. And then follow your heart, follow your passion, and be authentic. Be true to yourself. Because if you have that attitude and you use your passion, which is some of the strongest fuel you can put on the fire, you will go very far. Uh, in your dream, trust me. And once you have figured out what that dream is, then stop talking about it. Execute, 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 and just be relentless on the execution. Focus on it and 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 realize it. And and in the process, manage your time. Uh, time is one of the few resources you can't get back. Uh, money can come and go. Time always goes one way. So manage your time um, and do it together with a great team. Um, you don't have to be the smartest person in the room, uh, but surround yourself by the smartest persons around and, and, and build a great team. So one plus one plus one <laughs> equals five. That's, that's really key. And in the process, manage your risk. Uh, don't take uh, more risk than you're comfortable with and always measure the risk you're taking against the potential upside that you might get out of it, just like as any other investments, if you're doing an investment here when it comes to space and these crazy adventures and i certainly consider that every time um, you, you're ultimately putting your life at risk so it's got to be justified by the upside by the excitement and going into space is rightfully exciting i think uh, but not everybody would agree with that statement uh, fair enough mm -hmm. and then finally i would also encourage that whatever you do always inspire others always give back always try to do good for the people that are not perhaps in the privileged position that you're in, so that uh, you also give something back to society. And you also experience, as you do that, not only is it fantastically fun, a great privilege to do, but you'll also experience some resources when you least expect it come back to you as a boomerang, and, 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 and that's just a wonderful feeling. So, so those would be some of my good advice. Wonderful. I have a question that came in that I think slightly ties to that as well, but maybe more looking at the sort of corporate side of, of this. I mean, the the challenge with getting into space has been one that's been tackled over a long period of time. You said yourself you bought your first ticket 20 years ago, um, and if I'm not mistaken, you still haven't been up there yet. Um, so uh, what's, you know, that's a very long cycle, and, and we can see this in other industries as well. Um, you know, Boston Dynamics from a robotics standpoint, they've been working on, you know, for decades on that. We see the videos of robots doing backflips and stuff now, but that's a long uh, cycle of innovation and, as you said, very expensive to do. What, what's some of, do you have any advice for companies who are looking to innovate for the future rather than, you know, rather than take one step forward looking to jump five steps, um, maybe plan for something that's not even ready yet or here yet? 
Yeah, well, first and foremost, never give up on your dreams. Um, I mean, there's, there's been many occasions in the past 20 years where I could have given up on my dream for space, and 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 here we are now, finally on the on the on the cusp of going up. So, never give up on your dreams. Um, your dreams are an integral part of of you, whether it's you as a person or you as a company. Uh, your vision, your dreams, um, it's it's mission critical. It's it's core to the mission. So, never give up on those. When it comes to the corporate setting specifically, obviously there's always a balance uh, because you've got to manage your cash flow uh, and, and the business side of things. So you've got to make sure you have a, a decent business business mix between uh, either stable income or uh, some sort of shorter medium term income to also have some longer term income and potentially big upside and stuff. Um, and if you, if you have managed your business well in that regard, you can then afford to wait for that long term to materialize uh, and or invest in R&D today that might not immediately materialize in, in big payouts, but that has the potential of, of being really, really being the, the big elephants, the big the big uh, events or the big revenue producers in the future. And so you've got to have a mix of, of, of it all. But but I think it's also important to keep the, the short to medium uh, term uh, side of business or revenues in sight as well, because Otherwise, there is the risk that many entrepreneurs uh, do, um, where they uh, mismatch earnings with with cash flow. That and, and translated, that means that they have a good business, they have good contacts, but the the, the payoff from those uh, contracts or, or contacts that they have is just too far out, and they get killed by the cash flow because they have their own suppliers uh, wanting to be paid, etc. So management of cash flow. Management of the near to short, uh, the short to medium term business is is also important uh, for you to be su sustainable and successful in the long term. Because then that you have a platform to do all the big stuff as well, and you can afford uh, a bit of delay. Yeah, I, I think big picture um, visions is definitely an important part of business, and I think hopefully that's what we're looking to do with ourselves as well. And j just another quick one from me, and then I'll let you guys jump in if, if you've got anything else. Well, we've talked a good bit about space, but I, I mean, you're sort of an investor as well. What, what are you excited about on, on Earth? <laughs> Which is an, an unusual question, I guess, we don't ask very often, but, but what, what, are, what are you seeing on Earth that, that gets you excited these days? Uh, from an investment perspective? Uh, yeah, sure. Yeah, sure. I, I mean, sort of uh, closer to home. I mean, it's. Um, I mean, we're involved in a lot of real estate and 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 real estate investments and opportunities. Um, real estate is 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 a relatively simple business compared to space, uh, the space business. Um, but there are some good opportunities, and you know, ultimately, people need a place to live and stuff and there there is some it's a very established business um and it's relatively predictable um so so that's that's an area we look into um, there's also some good opportunities in in the green energy space that seems to be maturing uh, every day um i mean i remember um uh, four or five years ago i wrote a wrote a book about uh, green energy called the green bubble uh, and and one of the chapters had a description in there of offshore wind farms as being um, a bit fanciful, a bit too reliant on big subsidies and, and, and therefore not really worth the effort so much short term. But now, lo and behold, where we are today, uh, you now have these very big five megawatt uh, turbines and stuff, and they're actually sustainable in their own right economically, which is which is amazing. So, so they, we are slowly but surely moving into a commercially sustainable Green energy space, uh, which is one of the arguments uh, I, I made in my book, and 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 I was I was uh, crying out for, because I thought there was too too much money wasted on stupid things. Yeah. Uh, fortunately, yeah. I've got a little bit down the right track, so so there are opportunities there as well. Uh, but to be honest, it's really whatever is your sector, whatever is your flavor, and 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 there's you know there's a lot to choose from. But and you can't be clever in in, in all of the areas. Uh, but but for us, uh, real estate, we we allocate to external funds as well. So we do fund selection. Um, we're currently adding risk to the portfolio, uh, add, adding market risk. We still think that there's we're coming out of COVID now, and there's uh, there's the great opportunities uh, ahead of us. Uh, cost of capital is still cheap, interest rates are still cheap. So um, it's it, it's. The outlook is pretty pretty rosy, um, but there are some bottlenecks short term. Uh, 
we have you can't get chips these days so chimaget um you know ask toyota they can't get chips to their cars and they've had to cut down on production um um, and, and so you have bottlenecks, you know, the container uh, freight uh, shipping business from Asia to Europe, the rates are running through the roof at the moment, adding extra cost to it because of that bottleneck. There's just not a capacity in the system. Labor costs uh, will go up in the short term. Uh, here in Denmark, we can't get waiters and, and staff for hotels. Uh, I mean, hotels are refusing to take bookings at the moment because because they can't get their rooms cleaned. There's no cleaners. Um, so, so you have these sort of bottlenecks because everybody is now getting back to business uh, coming out of COVID um, and, and, and that's a big challenge but eventually it will, it will, it will even out. Yeah, uh, hopefully with some, uh, some innovation around that space and some creative thinking as well. Uh, oh, that's yeah. been fantastic. So great questions, guys. Um, so I have one final question, Pear, just on the, just top it up. Once you're bored of space, where's next? You've done everything <laughs> else. Where are you going next? Well, that's a good question. Um, <laughs> I have a few things still on my to-do list. Um, I, I, had, uh, I had two previous attempts uh, at the Titanic, um, oh. one, one at the Centennial um, and one in 2019 where we had another go. But on both occasions, sadly, seven weeks before we were supposed to, supposed to go, for different reasons, uh, the trip got called off. So um, I'm hoping I get third time lucky on that one. I, I do want to go down and see uh, probably the most famous dive site in the world, uh, Titanic. So deep dive missions uh, certainly excites me as well as going out and into space. Um, <laughs> and I'm really also once I've been to space, I want to go surprised. further and do more space trips yeah. and stuff like that. So, yeah. so, so yeah, there's, there's some very exciting things on the agenda. And um, yeah, I have another little trip coming up. Uh, I was due to do it in August here, but it, it got postponed slightly. Um, I don't know if you're aware, but there is the um, uh, the new uh, Top Gun movie is coming up soon yes. with Tom Cruise, which I, I hope you, you you'll all go and watch. Uh, I, think was, I think Top Gun One was was terribly exciting and and and, and, and really cool. Um, and I, I uh, I'm, I'm hoping to have a, an opportunity to um, to come out to the naval base where the film Top Gun fly out of there and land on an aircraft carrier in the Pacific. That's been Can one of my come with you? <laughs> oh, brilliant, fantastic. Wow. So there's no end to these adventures. I mean, we're going to see more and more from you, aren't we? So, I mean, I thought we were fascinated enough as it was, but there's more yet to come. Wow, amazing pair. Thank you so much for an extremely intriguing, interesting and fascinating session that we've had today. We've learned so much about you. We thought we knew it all, but we obviously didn't. <laughs> Uh, but really appreciate your time and thank you so much for being on the show. Yeah, it's a real pleasure. Thanks so much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank thank you. Care. you. Bye bye. <laughs> See you in space.